Canada since the pandemic started. Of course, governments at all levels have been facing pressures in terms of the costs of getting us through a pandemic, but also the hit to revenue. Now we know we're getting a federal budget on April 19th. What do we need to see in that plan as we hopefully start to put the worst of the pandemic behind us? Craig Alexander, Chief Economist, Executive Advisor at Deloitte Canada, and joins us now. And let's start there, Craig, because in the fall economic statement, we were teased with this idea of 70 to 100 billion in uh, sort of stimulus spending. Where do we sit right now? Do we need that kind of kick? Well, the economy is doing better than was expected a few months ago. One of the, I think one of the remarkable things is despite the second wave and the renewed uh, restrictions that governments imposed, it does look like the Canadian economy continued to grow in, in, the, in, the, in the first quarter of this year. And, and as we move forward, as the health risks diminish, we should see the, the global economy do, do better. We should see the Canadian economy grow at a stronger pace. So I would say that uh, growth forecasts have been revised upwards in, in recent months. And then that's leading to the question of, well, does, does the economy still need the 70 to $100 billion that, that the government had outlined in its throne speech? And I, I think the answer is that the government is still likely to deliver that, that amount of stimulus. I think that they've been working through the details of how they were going to uh, spend and invest that money. So I do think we will get the stimulus, even though the economy is doing a bit, a bit better. It is, it is still important to understand that we, we, are, you know, we are still deeply below pre-COVID levels, and the government could be looking at investments that don't just pay off in terms of accelerating activity this year, but making investments that would help the economy uh, in terms of improving its growth path over the sort of the medium to longer term, you know, the investments in, in, in areas like infrastructure could, could play a role on that part. Okay, that becomes key. Earlier in the program, uh, we were talking with one of, the, one of the people on the advisory council, sort of helping the government frame that policy. And, and you want to invest stimulus dollars into something that grows the economy, infrastructure. But also today, we got the PBO coming out saying, so far, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank, as far as they can tell from the signed contracts, hasn't been able to leverage the private sector. How, how does the government get around that issue? Right? We want, we want to take one buck of taxpayer dollars, and we want to turn it into something much greater for the economy. I have to assume the private sector needs to be a part of that. Well, there is, I mean, there is public infrastructure that can be done. I mean, when we look at the, you know, there's been lots of studies done looking at the state of infrastructure in Canada. One of the uh, reports I did uh, putting together a, a Deloitte competitiveness scorecard, uh, one of the areas of weakness for the Canadian economy was infrastructure. And, and in fact, what what you have is a situation that over years and years and years of, of, of weaker than optimal investment, there is actually uh, a gap. So there is areas where the, the government could put infrastructure dollars that, that would actually act as not just, not just public sector investment, but could, could act as a catalyst or a complement to private sector investment. Like in some cases, private sector investment is held back by the fact that you have, you have weak infrastructure. By, by alleviating some of that infrastructure, you can actually improve business investment. And then there's the question of beyond, you know, if there's investments the government wants to make beyond its fiscal capacity, then you need to crowd in the private sector. And that's what the infrastructure bank is about. So I think, I sort of think about this in two different frames. There's the investments that the, the government can make on its own. And then there's the investments that the government needs to crowd in private sector investment to, 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 help, to help fund. Now, when we take a look at the health of this economy right now, as you said, there is a way to go to get us uh, firing on all cylinders and all the areas that have been hit. It's interesting today that the Bank of Canada came out and said, at least in terms of the functioning of the financial system, we can start to remove some of those emergency liquidity programs we had in place and eventually starting to say, you know what, we're going to have to ease up on the gas pedal when it comes to buying government debt. I mean, the, I guess we should take this as a positive that the economy doesn't need these kinds of emergency measures anymore. No, it's unambiguously positive, right? The, you know, the very first thing the Bank of Canada did when the crisis hit was ensure that the the financial system continued to function, that money was still flowing, and that was one of the lessons from the 0809 financial crisis. So liquidity is 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 critical when when you have a, a major economic and financial shock. Um, at this stage, I think it does make sense to 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 wind down the the emergency liquidity support programs. 
And then the next stage is looking at the quantitative easing program and, and gradually scaling back the amount of bonds that are being purchased. Uh, but, then, but then there's going to be this period uh, where the bank is, is still reinvesting the bonds that mature. So in other words, they're not going to immediately start winding down their balance sheet. And, and part of the reason for that is that they don't, they don't want to, 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 to stop the QE program in, in an abrupt fashion that causes bond yields to suddenly jump that, that then could create a hit to, hit to the economy when it's still, still struggling to recover. So they're going to have to do this in an incremental fashion. And as we saw after the financial crisis of 2009, uh, it was actually very difficult for the U.S. Federal Reserve to, 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 to try to start winding down its balance sheet. And I suspect the Bank of Canada is going to have a similar challenge. So, and this is one of the reasons why the Bank of Canada can say, on the one hand, you know, we're going to, we're going to end the emergency liquidity support programs. But at the other, you know, on the other hand, it isn't a signal that interest rates are, are, are you know, short-term interest rates are going to be raising or are going to be rising very quickly, very soon. Right? So I still don't think the Bank of Canada is going to be raising the overnight rate till late 2022 or even into early 2023 because they still have to sort of adjust and, and deal with the quantitative easing program first. Craig, it's always great to get your insights. Thanks for taking the time to join us. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Craig. Craig Alexander is Chief Economist and Executive Advisor at Deloitte.